In case you missed it, UEFA are changing the format of their competitions, including the Champions League, again, and this time in a pretty radical way. From the 2024-25 season, so in just two seasons' time, the Champions League, the Europa League, and the Conference League group stages will no longer be made up of eight separate groups, each containing four teams, meaning that there are 32 teams who compete in the group stage in total. Instead, there will be 36 teams, all competing in one massive group. Under the current format, teams play six games in the group stage, as they play each of their opponents, both home and away. Of course, that isn't possible under the new format, which UEFA call the Swiss model, otherwise there would be about twice as many games as most domestic league campaigns. So instead, each team will play 10 games, rather than 6, 5 at home, and 5 away, and their final ranking will be determined by their results in those games. The top 8 teams in this massive 36 team group will automatically progress to the knockout stage. Meanwhile, the teams ranked from 9th to 24th place will go into a playoff round. Those playoffs will be seeded, just like the Football League playoffs for example, so teams ranked from 9th to 16th will face a team ranked 17th to 24th, and the teams ranked from 9th to 16th will also be assured of playing at home in the second leg, which UEFA views as being an advantage. The eight playoff winners progressed to the knockout stage, joining the top-ranked eight teams who already progressed in the round of 16. And from that point onwards, the Champions League knockout rounds will function just as they currently do, all the way to the final. Meanwhile, the losing playoff teams will drop down into the Europa League, and those teams ranked 25th to 36th are dumped out of European football entirely for the season. The reason for this change of format first and foremost, is because it creates more games on the UEFA schedule, and it creates the potential for more big games between so-called super clubs during the Champions League and, to a lesser extent, the Europa League group stage. Under the current format, where teams are seeded into four pots, with each group consisting of one team from each pot, the very biggest and best teams, in theory, ought to be separated during the group stage. Under the new format, that is no longer the case, and more games, and bigger games, means more revenue, which is of course UEFA's primary concern. The fact that each team is guaranteed to play at least 10 games, rather than only 6, and that only 12 teams will actually be eliminated during the group stage, meaning that 24 of the 36 teams are guaranteed to play at least 12 games, which is twice as many as the minimum number of games that a team can play during the group stage under the current format, is great news for UEFA. Also, by its very nature, the more games that a team plays, the fewer chances there are for upsets, meaning that, more often than not, the big boys should progress, which is also great news for those teams and for UEFA. That is why there are more upsets, for example, in a cup competition than there are in a full 38-game league campaign. UEFA gets big games early on then, but with relatively little jeopardy for those teams. Real Madrid could, theoretically, lose to Bayern Munich, Liverpool and Barcelona in three huge games in terms of interest and revenue, and still progress. That paints the new format in a relatively negative light, but on the flip side, speaking purely in a personal capacity here, I have never been a huge fan of the Champions League group stage. The existing seeding means that, with probably six out of the eight groups most years, most football fans could predict which two teams will progress, and prove to be correct. And when two of the big hitters meet, like, say, Inter Milan and Real Madrid this season, certainly in their second meeting at least, there isn't a great deal on the line. Both teams know that they are through. It's not that uncommon to see teams like Bayern Munich or Ajax this season, who won all six group games, able to actually rest players in their last couple of games. Already assured, not only of qualifying for the knockout stage, but also of progressing in top spot. I also think that the proposed playoff round between the 9th to 24th ranked teams could be really exciting, better than anything that we get in the group stage now at least. So overall, despite the motivation, as always, being a financial one, I am fairly indifferent to those reforms of European competitions, but it is 
another reform in terms of where the four extra teams will come from, as each of those competitions expands from having 32 to 36 teams within their group stage, which you may or may not have heard about, which I don't think is a very good idea. Of the four additional slots allocated to teams in the Champions League from the 2024-25 season onwards, slot one goes to the team that finishes third in the fifth highest ranked association as per UEFA coefficients. So, at the time of recording, that would be Ren in Ligue 1. Slot 2 is awarded to one additional team from UEFA's so-called Champions Path qualification route, which is essentially title-winning teams from associations where the title winners aren't afforded automatic qualification due to having a low coefficient ranking. And slots 3 and 4 will go to two clubs with the highest UEFA club coefficient ranking who miss out on qualification via the traditional route. Basically, it will function as a bit of a get-out-of-jail-free card for two of European football's biggest clubs if they have a disappointing season. Manchester United, for example, who have had a poor campaign this season, relatively speaking. If they are to finish fifth, they will miss out on playing Champions League football next season. Under the new format, though, coming in 2024, barring any freak outcomes like Real Madrid and Bayern Munich both finishing 5th in La Liga and in the Bundesliga, Manchester United would still qualify for the Champions League, despite finishing 5th, because of their strong performance in Europe over the last 5 years, which puts them ninth in UEFA's club coefficient rankings, sandwiched between Juventus and Atletico Madrid. This is very bad, I think. Not only because of its very transparent motive, clearly designed to appease some of Europe's biggest clubs who have made threats and various power plays towards UEFA in the past, whilst also benefiting UEFA themselves from a financial perspective, due to these teams being so lucrative to them due to their commercial appeal and large support, but also because of the fundamental fact that, put simply, if you are not good enough to finish in the top four of your domestic league, you have absolutely no business competing in the so-called Champions League, which is already a misnomer, for a competition which has been repeatedly watered down over recent years. I am not, as some people are, a hardline European Cup or Champions League purist. I don't really have any problem with Europe's Premier Cup competition allowing multiple teams to compete from the strongest leagues, even if they aren't actually champions. I think that the Champions League is richer for it, and I don't just mean financially, though it should probably change its name because it quite literally is not a league, nor is it just for champions, but that is very much a minor point. My gripe with those two slots going to Team 2 essentially weren't good enough to actually qualify for the Champions League, but have historically been successful, is primarily what it represents. If the reason why football fans protested against the creation of the European Super League is because it removed the jeopardy from football and dictated that the teams who would compete at the highest level the following season would no longer be based solely upon their actual results during the previous campaign, well, that is exactly what this is. Sure, it might be a watered-down version. In fact, it is a very watered-down version. But the principle is exactly the same. And if you allow two new Champions League places to be allocated to big clubs who have failed to qualify via the traditional route, you can bet that they won't stop at that. They will push for four places, maybe six, then eight, until, hey, you, you know what, how about just the top 20 ranked teams in UEFA's club coefficients just, you know, qualify automatically? Wouldn't that be better for everyone? Uh, well, no. I don't think that it would, actually. The very essence of sport, and the reason why it captivates people so much, is because of its unpredictability. And every step that football's authorities have taken during pretty much my entire lifetime, I am 26 years old, has either deliberately or unintentionally reduced the unpredictability of the sport, at least at the elite level. The breakaway of the Premier League from the Football League reduced unpredictability. Parachute payments reduced unpredictability. The expansion of the World Cup and the European Championships reduced unpredictability. Seeding teams in almost 
every tournament, reduced unpredictability. Even something that is ostensibly good, and was widely lauded as being a welcome addition to the game at the time of its introduction, like financial fair play, is still an agent of decreased unpredictability when you think about it. By saying that teams can only spend a certain proportion of how much money they bring in, you are essentially fixing the current formation of clubs based upon their levels of income at the time in which FFP was introduced, therefore making it much more difficult for other teams whose only previous route into the upper echelons of the game might have been to spend a fortune like Chelsea or Man City did to disrupt that already established elite. The World Cup is a great example, as well as being a very current example, of exactly what I'm talking about. In 2026, the World Cup will be expanded from 32 teams, which has been the format since the 1998 World Cup, and will be the format in 2022, to 48 teams. That is, 16, yes, 16 extra teams. Or, an entire World Cup's worth of extra teams, up until the 1978 tournament in Argentina at least, who wouldn't qualify under the existing qualification system, but will do from 2026 onwards. So, Italy, who are already out of World Cup qualification, despite being the reigning European champions, potentially Portugal, who have to play North Macedonia, you will already know if they have won that game when this video comes out, any two of Peru, Colombia and Chile, if not all three, and several big hitters in Africa, all of whom have or could fail to qualify for the upcoming World Cup at the time of this recording, would be given a lifeline under the new framework. There are plenty of people who will think that's great. They don't want those countries to miss out, and I suspect I would have felt a similar way when England failed to qualify for Euro 2008. But that is sort of the point isn't it? This is the World Cup and the European Championships, the literal pinnacle of the global and European game, in the most popular sport in the world. It's not supposed to be easy. That is why qualifiers exist, that's why Argentina didn't qualify for the 1970 World Cup, the Netherlands weren't present in 1986, or France in 1994, just four years before they won the thing, and it's why the likes of Iraq, Jamaica, and North Korea twice, have all qualified in the past. Otherwise, we might as well just say that the top 48 highest ranked national teams in the FIFA World Rankings at the time of the tournament qualify automatically, or the 48 teams with the most previous appearances at previous tournaments, or how about all 210 FIFA-affiliated national football teams from England to Eritrea get to go to the World Cup, so there is no qualification process at all, and instead of there being 48 teams, there are just 42 groups, each made up of 5 teams, where only the team that wins that group, plus the 22 highest ranked group stage runners up, get to progress to a straight knockout stage. Alright, careful now Alfie, don't be giving them any ideas. On second thoughts, that actually does sound quite fun, much too exciting for football's governing bodies, they would never go for it. They'd have to find a way to somehow complicate it, make it slightly more tedious, and ensure that none of the big boys accidentally get knocked out by Burkina Faso or North Macedonia during the group stage. Alright, I know, I'm ranting a little, and there are bigger problems in the world right now. Approximately 758 billion of them, I suspect, or somewhere in that region, but it is a bit irritating, and needless. And these things are being done solely to maximise profits and appease friends in high places, whether that be at the biggest and richest clubs, or at the biggest, richest and most corrupt football associations. Also, in the case of UEFA at least, that appeasement is now rooted even deeper within a sense of self-preservation, as some of their most lucrative constituents continue to threaten to walk away from them and create their own even more hideously incestuous, predictable, and tedious system league and organisation. There is a danger here, I think, that football kills its own golden goose. You know, the old folk tale about the goose that would lay a single golden egg once a day, until its owner, who wanted all of its gold at once, decided to kill the goose, and therefore the golden eggs were no more. That fable, which 
is commonly credited to the Greek storyteller and slave Aesop, has long been used as a parable to extol the folly of destroying a valuable resource and therefore negatively impacting your own future profits and prosperity for the purpose of short-term gain, motivated by greed. In the space of about 175 years, football has gone from being a game that was played by posh boys at Cambridge and Eton in their spare time until they were beaten at their own game by the working classes who exported the sport across the globe to one that is now played and watched by more men, women and children than any other sport and is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. It has been on that journey from being extremely exclusive to being adored by literally billions of people precisely because of the fundamental tenets of football that are the reason why most of us fell in love with the sport. It is simple, accessible, and the very nature of football, which is lower scoring than just about any other team sport, has always made it almost uniquely unpredictable. But in recent years, all three of those factors, football's simplicity, accessibility, and its unpredictability, which made it such a lucrative business in the first place, have come under threat by precisely the same people who seek to exploit the sport and extract every last penny from it that they possibly can. Football has become more complicated by needless rule and format changes, less accessible, at least from an affordability perspective, whether that be the cost of watching games live, on television, or even just buying your kid their team's latest replica kit, and much, much less competitive. I watched Downfall on Netflix a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Don't worry if you haven't. It is a documentary about Boeing, who are one of the world's two largest manufacturers of passenger jets, along with Airbus, among other things, and it tells the story of how Boeing went from being a company which, for decades, put excellence, safety, and ingenuity at the forefront of everything that they did, employing the best staff, from engineers through to mechanics, paying them good wages, with paid holidays, pension contributions, and all the rest, and where sustained profits simply followed as an inevitable consequence of those business practices. To one where the key decision makers went from being people who were passionate about aeroplanes, to people who were passionate about profit, workers were removed from the board and from senior management, staff pay and conditions radically declined, and the focus turned from safety and ingenuity to cutting costs and maximising short-term profit. Boeing is a very emotive and easily understood example of the Wall Streetification of a business, if you like, but this is a process that has happened across so many sectors and in so many industries. Publicly traded companies have to publish their company accounts once a quarter, so four times a year, and typically, if a company beats their expected earnings, their share price will go up. If they fail to meet or exceed those earning expectations, along with some of their other numbers, their stock price is likely to go down. The salaries of people employed at these companies in senior management positions is often intimately tied to stock performance, sometimes with it being worth hundreds of times more to them than their actual salaries. In 2021, for example, Apple CEO Tim Cook was paid his very handsome regular base salary of 3 million US dollars. Not bad. But due to the increase in Apple's share price during 2021, he was also paid 12 million dollars in incentives plus a further 82 million dollars in stock rewards. In other words, Tim Cook's actual salary only constituted 3% of what he was paid by Apple in 2021 in total. The incentive structure here is all wrong. We, and when I say we, I don't mean you and I, but actually only a tiny strata of very rich and very powerful people have created a system which very literally encourages the management classes to go around slaughtering metaphorical golden geese, and when those golden eggs stop being laid as a consequence, the people who butchered the geese make out like bandits, whilst ordinary people and employees are left to pick up the pieces. The consequence tends to be rising unemployment and ever-increasingly precarious and exploitative forms of employment, in case the metaphor was becoming a little too strained there. I appreciate that this might all seem like a bit of a wild tangent to go off on whilst talking about a restructuring of the UEFA Champions League, but 
I don't think that it is. It's actually almost the exact same thing. Management swerps, who in some respects are only doing what anyone would, given their MO and incentive schemes, have now got their teeth into the business of football, without really caring about or understanding the sport, just as Boeing's disastrous management team didn't give a hoot about aeroplanes, and they are saying, alright, here's this thing called football, this is how they're running it at the moment, how can we maximise profits in Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on, with scant regard for the consequences of what it might actually do to football, and indeed, to football's own commercial viability in the long run. In the case of Boeing, the consequence of their changes of priorities, cost-cutting measures, and short-term thinking, the documentary downfall posits, was not just redundancies, worsening worker conditions, and a huge hit to future profits, but actually, two major plane crashes within the space of only five months, both involving the new Boeing 737 MAX aircraft, which resulted in the deaths of 346 people and zero survivors. The short-sightedness of football's executives is unlikely to carry a direct death toll like that, thankfully, nor are elite-level footballers likely to suffer a dramatic fall in pay and conditions anytime soon. But all of the other negative outcomes are a very real possibility. If, in an effort to extract every possible penny out of the game over the next 5, 10, or 15 years, the powers that be in football manage to significantly worsen the product that is on offer, how much it captures the public's imagination, and how much money people are willing to invest in the sport, either directly or indirectly, they will end up with a dead goose, and lots of very confused men in suits stood around, wondering where it all went wrong, as they fail upwards, with a bloodied meat cleaver still tightly held in the palm of their hands, straight into their next comfy job. So, yeah. In short, I don't think the Champions League reforms are very good. For what it's worth, and I suspect that it is very little, personally, I would love to see the Champions League return to its format up until 1991, when it was just one massive knockout competition, without any group stage, but I'd go one step further and make all ties just a single leg, without replays, drawn at random at either a home or away ground, with no seeding, so Bayern Munich versus Real Madrid could be the opening game or the final. I would scrap all qualifiers, every title winner qualifies automatically, along with all existing automatically qualified teams. And it would be absolute mayhem. Lose your opening game against Sheriff Tiraspol? Too bad, PSG. See you next year. Manchester United dumped out on penalties by Albanian champions KF Tirana, who play with nine centre-backs for 120 minutes. Well, that is just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. It'll never happen, but hey, we can all dream. That is it for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. If you did enjoy it, feel free to hit the like button. Apparently, that is good for me somehow. Uh, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC Sevens. You can also find me personally on social media, on either Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC Sevens on both, should you wish to do so.